there are several um, sheets that go along with this um, chart that tell you a little bit about each of the ones in the table. So I really love just looking at this chart because it helps me start thinking about, okay, what criteria am I interested in? What let me, gets me started on thinking about what species or what groups of uh, plants do I need to start looking at to match with my goals? So that's why I, I really like this chart. Um, and, you know, just like we studied the periodic table, which this, uh, of elements that this table uh, models, um, we can learn a lot about each of these individual species. But if we're starting out, this table is organized, you know, into grassy species. This chunk here in the middle, broad leaves, we've got um, warm season grasses and cool season grasses. And within the broad leaves, sort of this chunk here that are legumes in the middle. And each one is rated based on its growth cycle, its water use, high or low. And then, you know, how it grows. Is it upright or prostrate? Um, and will it, will it uh, spread? So I think this is a great thing to help organize your thinking, or even helping you to see, you know, like what are some of the species that I might want to start thinking about, uh, learning more about in depth. This table is starting to get old. This table is over 10 years old now. And there are more things that can be added to this table that aren't here. And, uh, and Lee brought some of them up this morning. So when I get organized to think about what I'm going to plant in my experiments, I think about these different plant types, cool season versus warm season species, broad leaves versus grasses. Do I want taproot or a fibrous root? Something that fixes nitrogen versus something that's going to scavenge that nitrogen. And then usually it's tolerance to frost. Now, once you think about those plant types, you should also be thinking about when am I going to be planting it? Is it early in the summer where we really want warm season things that are going to do well and flourish with that heat? Is it late summer, early fall where you need to start eating a mixture or at least shifting to cool season species? Or am I really focusing on what's going to come in that late fall period and really into the next spring where you want something? And then as, as we described, thinking about the realities of your seeding equipment, how does that match with seed size? Um, and which ones are going to tolerate the range of tough soil conditions that we might throw at it, thinking about salinity or wet soils. So this is a nice framework, but how do we get from thinking about this framework to picking out species? And that's what I'd like to spend some time practicing with you here today. I've got a whole bunch of slides that I'm going to skip through here that are illustrating these different species, and I feel like Lee's already taken us through this, so I'm not going to spend the time to really go through these cool season species, um, the warm season species, cool season legumes, warm season legumes, those large taprooted species that we have, things that are more tolerant to salinity things that are good for pollinators. So I'd like to go through three scenarios with you where I sort of model this selection, and then we're gonna spend a lot of our time here, maybe about 20 minutes, just talking through some scenarios and giving you the chance to talk at your tables to practice and some of these things and to make some, make some selections. So I thought I would talk about, you know, picking cover crops for uh, alleviating soil compaction because that's a hot topic. Um, so for soil compaction, I'm definitely looking for something that has a lot of root pressure um, and that it's going to grow well when the soils are wet. And that's important because that's the only time where that root pressure is able to push through those root restricting layers to make those root channels that you need. And it's not you know, these, these big roots up at the top, it's that tiny little root that's pushing through that root restricting layer, okay? And the only time, just like when you push things into the ground, be it pole or fence posts, you can only push it in when the soil is wet. And so in our environment, the only time when we guarantee you have wet soil is in the springtime. Well, we hope you have wet soil in the springtime. <laughs> this fall, we have lots of wet soil. <laughs> So maybe we get lucky some years. So you might have thought, you know, my answer was going to be we need radishes because those radishes 
have that really, that big root pressure. But in our environment, we're not going to have those radishes growing in the springtime. And we have so much canola in our rotation, it's really not bringing us that diversity. It's really bringing us a lot of risks. I would love to have another plant like radish that brings us that diversity. But right now, I don't think that we have it. Maybe beet is the closest thing that we've got, and we've talked about seed costs for beet. So I think, you know, it may not be the species with the most root pressure, but I think I would go for something like rye right now or fibrous root system that's going to create lots of those channels, and then we have to preserve those channels going into the future. Okay, let's take another scenario. It's really wet in your field. What am I going to plant there? Well, the criteria that I set out for myself when I did an experiment, like right when I got started here, it was full of energy, ready to change the world in Manitoba um, in 2011, was I wanted something that was going to grow really well in June when it was finally dry enough that I could track the field with my cedar, with my planter. Um, so I, I chose sorghum sedan. And then I also wanted something that was going to handle tough soil conditions. I found sorghum to be fairly resilient. It's not super small seeded, it's a little bit larger seeded, so it's wet, so it's going to have enough water to germinate. I liked sorghum sedan. The other thing I wanted is I wanted that water use to extend beyond that warm period into the cold period to keep on transpiring that water out of the soil. And so I chose to put radish in the understory. And that radish was protected by the biomass from the, sor from the sorghum. The sorghum, you could, this is a picture that was taken in late September, so the sorghum had already been terminated by frost, but it provided a nice canopy to protect that radish. And the radish itself will last until you get about a minus two frost. Um, so this mixture worked really well for me, and I have some data on how we were able to reduce um, water in the rooting zone from, from this cover crop in a wet field. Okay, the last example that I wanted to model myself was pollinator habitat. And we have an exciting new project collaboratively at the U of M when we're looking at pollinator habitat. And this spring, one of my big challenges was picking out this mixture. And I know some of you have, are in the crowd that participated in this, and they'll know how challenging it was for me to actually pick what we were going to put into this mix. Um, but I think things turned out pretty well. Here's a picture from the site we have at Calvert, south of Winnipeg. Um, and some of the things that I saw in this mix this year that did really well were some of the things that um, we talked about. Celia, buckwheat, flower well really attracted a lot of pollinators. We also had sunflowers. They were the occasional plant, as we described in the mix. And then the other things that we had sort of in the understory that I really liked were Persian clover and crimson clover. And this is a spendy mix. This is not inexpensive. So I don't know how to balance that other than say, pick how big of an area you want to have pollinator habitat for and pick places on your farm where you want to invest in that habitat. Okay, so those are some examples of me modeling this and you can see that uh, there's lots of lots of room for interpretation, and I wanted to give you an opportunity here today with the people that have come together to talk about a few different scenarios. I know that all of you are kind of feel like, well, I don't really know what species to pick, but I think that you'll have a great opportunity here to talk with people and brainstorm. Talk about this first scenario, which is similar to mine. It's June. You have a wet field with an area of the field that was flooded and too wet for planting. What would you plant in that area? So that we'll talk about. Yeah. It takes time in my classrooms for students to be comfortable to talk to each other about their ideas too. But at least at your table, you're talking. That's terrific. Okay. Scenario number two. And I think we'll just do this second scenario, um, and then I'll tell you. I'll give you a research update. Um, so this scenario here is uh, also very realistic in Manitoba, so planting a cover crop in August after winter wheat. I think this is our best window. What would you plant in this window? And you could talk about if it was a dry fall or a wet fall. I mean, I've kind of both this year. It's really dry and then it turns super wet. So 
So if you want to put a variation on it, you can talk about what you might one of the things I also want to talk about is how do you measure success? Me as a, a researcher, I have tools. You might think, well, I need Yvonne's toolkit or Yvonne to come and measure exactly what's happening with my cover crop. Or I wish I, Yvonne could do it. But there are many things that you can do and you have to decide what's meaningful to you. So maybe you're looking for changes in soil structure and a shovel test is something that you can do. Maybe yield is the most important thing and so you need to leave that check strip for yourself to know whether it's plus minus or a wash. Maybe just establishing the cover crop itself is success, right? I figured out a way to get this planted. That plant's down is your measure of success. Maybe it's the amount of biomass you're able to grow. Maybe you want to go to a lab. Uh, things like aggregate stability, AgBuys is now offering that. You can do your own thing with a jar of water. Maybe you need to pick some areas where you're going to track them with a soil test. And that soil test could be for nutrients, or it could be things for like soil organic matter. Uh, soil health tests are now a great area. We have some labs that are offering tests that if you get a number, we don't have any number to know whether that's high, low, or medium, right? So when you're evaluating whether you're gonna spend that money for that soil health test, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to get from that number that you get from the lab? So are you committed to following that number within a season or over seasons? Um, we hopefully as a research community are going to be supporting, uh, if we can get research dollars directed and focused in this area on helping to calibrate those values uh, to have meaningful numbers over time, but we don't work now. Okay, so that's another challenge, an idea that I want to plant. I want to shift gears now and talk about the research update. So what is going on in my lab to support cover crop research or for cover crop research to support farmers that are innovating in Manitoba? And one of the things that I want to start with is maybe not what you're expecting, but is a survey. Because I think as a community of people growing and working with cover crops, we need to know what's happening. Because uh, I, I perceive a shift but there's really no way right now for us to monitor or capture that shift. And a bunch of people need to know what these numbers are. They could be policymakers, they could be boards or other bodies that make decisions about funding research. We know we need more funding for research on cover crops on the prairies. And so um, I've started a survey that is funded through the Manitoba government and through General Mills for the next uh, three years, and this week I was able to get my survey live, um, and I am welcoming all of you to please contribute your voices and uh, and please participate in my survey. I've designed it so that it takes only five minutes, and if you are connected to networks of people that are doing cover crops, if you can help me um, pass up the word for the survey, you can find, probably the easiest way to find my survey is through Twitter, if you can find my handle. There's a, a pinned tweet with a link to this online survey that you can do on your phone. And I designed it so that it just takes five minutes. If you are not on Twitter or you don't have a phone, uh, my graduate students will be around at lunchtime where you can find me, and I would be very excited if you would do the survey for me here today before you leave. Um, so thank you for your participation. I think this is probably one of the biggest things that we can do to move things forward for research. <coughs> we also have some research studies that are underway in 2019 just trying to figure out some of the agronomy of cover crops. So we've talked a lot about overwintering cover crops. Um, one experiment that Virginia's been working on is uh, termination dates for rye. And so we're comparing four termination dates, two weeks before planting, which is early, just before planting, four days, day after planting, and then 
way too late, two weeks after planning. So we want to know that risk of if you can't get it and you can't turn in. What are you up against? And we're comparing this direct seeding into that rye residue or, uh, or growing rye versus having a strip till where we create a little bit of space to balance that competition. So that's pretty interesting. And then we're growing two low residue crops, soybeans and edible beans in our test crop. Both of them are nitrogen fixers, and so, but they're very different types of, um, of beans, and we're fertilizing the edible beans in this scenario. So Virginia's got piles of, di of biomass, she's got plant counts, but I don't have any data to show you right now, but this was a really interesting and exciting experiment. Here's just a picture of the experiment um, just after soybean planting um, in May this year. So you'll hear, you can hear more about this experiment um, from me probably in my presentation at Ag Days in January, <coughs> and I'll be I posted some pictures of this experiment on Twitter that you can also follow. Another great experiment that Virginia is running, she's a busy student, is looking at planting dates. So we've got eight different species. Well, actually one of them is a mix of all these species. And we planted them um, at three different dates, August 15th, September 1st, and September 15th. And it's really exciting because the experiment actually worked this year. We had rain in September, and so they all grew. The, this is a picture here of our August 15th. And um, I have a really nice set of pictures on Twitter that you can find looking at those other two dates. Basically, you know, September 15th, we had cotyledons up, and that was about it. And September 1st, we had things with one or two leaves this year. Another experiment that I'm doing collaboratively with Emma, with you at, in the animal science department at the U of M, is looking at intercropping with corn. And the angle for this experiment is looking at uh, winter grazing of corn. So we have sort of a dual purpose experiment where I'm interested in establishing covers underneath corn, and Emma's interested in designing a system where we can supplement high protein forage with corn that has a lot of starch and abundant energy, but is, is protein deficient for, for background cattle. It was a really dry year this year, and so I think if I think about this experiment, one of my measures of success is just plant stance. Did my understory crop establish? And it did. Uh, here's my technician Cody. He's standing in uh, in the experiment uh, when the corn was at the B4 stage. I believe we planted them uh, between B5 and B6 after we had two passes of herbicide in this Roundup Ready corn. And these are pictures. Um, from September, this is early September when the corn canopy is dying back. This is at Kelburn Farm where we had a lot more corn um, because it was on clay soil and I think the corn just had more water to draw on throughout the season. And here's me later in September in our experiment at Carmen where the corn suffered a lot more from drought stress and the canopy died back faster and you can just see that there's a little bit more growth. Now we had a question about 60 inch rows basic corn, and that's really my next question, because I see in the system from the experiment this year is, we had some room, and if we'd come in and had this cover crop established and then cut it off with silage, we would have had a lot more room to grow that high protein forage that Emma was interested in. Now I have a little bit of data um, that we worked up for applying for money to expand this project for next year, where we've got dry matter. This is stuff that we harvested October 1st, so superhuman effort to get this biomass data. Um, you can see the plant stands. This is in plants per meter of row that we were able to establish in our five different treatments. Um, and I would say, you know, there wasn't one species that really stood out as the winner this year. I thought our mix looked really good. Um, the hairy vetch didn't have a lot of biomass, but we got good stands established. We definitely had challenges with radish establishing, but I think I also low-balled the seeding rate. We were planting around eight pounds per acre. So another question might be, was the corn effective by having this understory crop growing with it after uh, B5 or B6 we established it? And the answer is no, and I 
could, I'm sorry, I just added these after to try and give you some data today, but there was no significant difference in corn biomass, and there was no interaction between corn biomass and the different intercrops that we tried this year. So it was a dry year, and this isn't corn yield, but this is biomass that we harvested October 1st. And you know, this is a fantastic corn biomass, but it's not bad. And you can see that we had a lot more biomass at Calburn than we did at, at Carmen. And I think you can see how the intercrop uh, numbers for biomass are reflected in just each site having different amounts of, of competition for light. So some interesting stuff and some new ideas. We are going to be looking one way or another at wider row spacing corn. Um, so if you're trying it, let me know. And if you're interested, keep following. So those two experiments are really focused on the nuts and bolts of how do we actually plant the agronomy of the cover crop itself. We also have two experiments that started um, this one in 2018 that are looked, looking at the whole system. So, okay, that happened in one year, Yvonne, the corn wasn't hurt, but what happens if we accumulate these benefits over time? So we're now two years into a rotation study where we're comparing a four-year rotation with cover crops to a four-year rotation without cover crops at five locations on the prairies. And we have a site in Lethbridge where it's really dry. We've got a site in Atlanta and Redverse. We've got a site up north in Saskatoon with Kate Congreves and Steve Shirtliff. And then I've got two sites here in Manitoba, Carmen and Wendy. You can't read this. Sorry, it's super small. But at each of these sites, I wanted to give you a feel for the different crops that we're growing in our, in our two four-year rotations. And then we're comparing them to two different things. We're comparing them to a two-year short rotation of wheat and canola, and then you know our soil-building perennial crops to see how fast. If, if, if we were going to build soil health fast, you know, you'd probably say, well, put it into perennials. So we're going to compare it to that. Each of these sites has picked four different crops that represent sort of what's typical or important in their area. And then we tried to, rather than pick the same cover crops everywhere, we tried again to pick cover crops that were suitable for, for that site and that, and that crop. So we have different combinations. So in my site here in Carmen and at Glen Lee, we've got red clover underseeded to wheat, which we've always had to reseed because it's been too dry and the clover establishes but then dies off. We are growing um, a, a barley pea mix after our canola when it comes off. We are seeding rye after the oat in rotation. These are two cereals, but I want this rye to set up for my soybeans for the next year, so I'm seeding green soybeans into that rye. And then after my soybean crop, or in the soybean crop, I'm interseeding radishes. Again, for the last two years, my radishes have died off and we've had to interseed them. But we had our best catch of radishes this year uh, in row seeded in the soybeans, so that was <coughs> exciting for this year. Okay. Here is some numbers on what we were able to grow, not in 2019, but last year in 2018. So 2018 was the first year of the study. This was our first year at all these sites trying to grow cover crops. Everyone remembers 2018, it was pretty dry. So these are pretty, you know, this looks like a big thing, but the, these numbers here are very small. This is 300 kilograms per hectare. And I would like to see that number up around 3,000 kilograms per hectare. So these are small numbers. And, uh, and so we successfully established cover crops, but we did not successfully grow big biomass in this experiment in 2018. We also looked at crop yields, and remember that you know some of these crops did not have anything, no cover crops growing in them during this year. So uh, we did not have any statistical differences in our crop yields from 2018, but we're trying, we're starting, we're gonna be monitoring these crop yields over time. We're gonna be monitoring what's happening in the soil over time, we've got the baseline soil samples. And we're also gonna be looking at nutrient cycling in depth in, in this experiment with a whole team of people um, on the prairie. So there's gonna be lots of good things to come from this experiment, I think, in the next five years. 
Callum, who's right up here, is my uh, lead student who's working on integrating the plant and soil analyses across these sites. Okay, so that's in small plots. I also wanted to work in real farms. And so this year in 2019, we've started four on-farm experiments in Red River Valley and but Adam Gurr, we've got one site in Western Manitoba that started in 2017. Um, I would like to find additional sites for this experiment in Western Manitoba. So if you are in Western Manitoba and are really passionate about measuring and comparing, what we're doing is we're comparing four replicated strips with and without covers in whatever rotation the farmer is working with for these three years of, with some luck and funding and the farmers maybe will be able to that like the small plot experiment. Um, some of the people that are participating in this experiment you are going to be hearing from today in the past. So you, I'll let them tell you how it went, whether it was all sunshine and roses or a little rough to start off. Okay, I think that's all for my research update. Um, and there is research here and the data is coming in that we're processing a lot of samples this winter and we're working with a lot of data. And um, there are resources for selecting cover crops. Not all of them are detailed to us here in Manitoba right now. It's important to match the species that we picked with your goals. And we had a chance to go through some scenarios today. I was able to talk with you about some of the research that I've got started. And I would be uh, very <coughs> excited if any of you that could cover crops in 2019 could participate in our survey so that we can start collecting data to influence those that uh, make decisions about allocating research, both for funding for research and for program dollars, but what's actually happening on the right Thank you for that. I know it's noon now and it's lunchtime. I'm looking to Heather to do, I don't think, do we want to answer questions or take questions right now? Questions later. So let's